Good evening, everyone. My name is Sebastian Lay. I'm the Marine Biological Laboratory's Chief Advancement Officer. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second Falmouth Forum of this, this season. Uh, this one, we're trying to mix it up a little bit with the forum and not be sort of stuck to the podium, as it were. So uh, we're very pleased to, to have this uh, experience to share with you this evening. We have a really healthy online audience tonight of uh, over 270 people. So we can imagine a full auditorium here, pretty much. Uh, and of course, we have a nice audience in, uh, in the CLAP auditorium this evening. Um, two housekeeping items, please do turn your cell phones off. Um, I know we're going to be in for a treat tonight, so we don't want to interrupt. And secondly, this uh, will be uh, both simulcast and recorded, so uh, just be aware of that. Um, and uh, my final thing is to just please thank the Falmouth Forum Committee who selects our speakers, invites them, uh, and really tries to balance the mix of culture, history, and science that we present uh, to the Falmouth community on a year-round basis. Um, it's something that we're trying to, like I said, be creative about. And so if you do have ideas, please do share those with us. Um, this is, is meant to be a resource to the community and something that enriches uh, the MBL community and the wider community here in Woods Hole and Falmouth. Um, with that, I, I just want to welcome the chair of the Falmouth Forum Committee, uh, Susan Morris, who uh, labors on our behalf and is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Susan. Thank you, Sebastian, and good evening and welcome again to the Marine Biological Laboratory and to the MBL Falmouth Forum. Before we get, begin tonight's um, lecture, I'd like to thank the friends of the MBL for bringing free cultural enrichment to our community through the sponsorship of the Falmouth Forums. Tonight's presentation is just one of the many lectures programs and performances that are offered each year free of charge by the Falmouth Forum. I invite you all to pick up a copy of this year's series um, on the table as you leave. And please feel free to take a couple to mail or give to friends. We really are encouraging um, a broader audience and would love to have more people know about our wonderful forums. The series is supported by an endowment established by a generous group of individuals, foundations, and organizations. And the programming that we are able to bring to the community is unsurprisingly direct, directly related to the amount of donations contributed to the Falmouth Forum Endowment. Many thanks to those of you who have made gifts to this endowment. And we always welcome other donations. We're honored to have with us this evening, Joseph McGurl, one of America's leading landscape painters. Not only has Mr. McGurl won significant awards for his artwork, but he has also been designated a living master by the Art Renewal Center. He is a signature member of the Plein Air Painters of America, a fellow of the American Society of Marine Artists, and was a Copley master with the Copley Society of Boston. Mr. McGurl, who lives in Katomet, grew up working with his father, a muralist, and his most influential teacher. He graduated from Massachusetts College of Art and studied in England and Italy. As a yacht captain sailing the East Coast from Maine to the Caribbean, he was able to observe and interpret the natural world in paint. For a more solid training in drawing, he studied sight size figure drawing under Robert Cormier for two years. I will leave it to Mr. McGurl to define, define sight size figure and landscape painting. Mr. McGurl is a devoted plein air painter, which allows him to connect with the landscape on a profound level and gain a deep understanding of his subject. For him, the landscape, whether it is the Northeast Coast, the American West, or the Florida shoreline, 
provides endless inspiration for his extraordinary work. Please join me in welcoming Joe McGurk. Thanks very much, Susan, for that nice introduction. I'd like to also thank all of you for coming out this evening and listening to my uh, little talk and watching the demo. And special thanks to Tucker Clark and the Falmouth Forum Committee for extending the invitation, and Chris April for coordinating it, and to Mike Schenbacker for his amazing job in setting up this video and audio system. It's always tricky when you're uh, painting to try to have someone film it at the same time. So I think he did a pretty good job. So thanks, Mike. Um, I guess I could start out by asking the question, why would I want to paint? What made me become an artist? So why did I have that desire? And I think it was something just that was innate within me. When I was about five years old, I was always drawing and I loved drawing. My dad was an artist too, and I think that obviously had a pretty significant influence on me, not only from watching him uh, uh, paint and do his artwork, but also there was probably something genetic because um, for some reason I had this ability to draw and paint where my other siblings really didn't. <laughs> um, so my dad, as I said, was an artist, but he didn't do oil paintings the way I do. He did, he did um, a lot of murals in restaurants, hotels. We did a lot of painting in churches, um, restoration of statues in churches. And so he's sort of a jack of all trades. And he, would, uh, he had five kids to support, so he would never say no to a job. And he got some really crazy jobs every now and then. Here's uh, myself when I was in college working with dad. We were painting murals on the karate studio of the Fred Valari Studio of Self-Defense. <laughs> and then another day, we might be on top of one of the domes at Harvard, gold leafing the dome. There was a picture in the globe of my dad up there putting on gold leaf. Um, we did marbleizing where we'd take wooden panels and paint them to look like marble. And so he really just did just about anything he could with paint to uh, make his career. And in those days, there was no internet, so everything was word of mouth. So he would, for instance, we were for a long period doing a lot of restaurants in China, uh, murals in Chinese restaurants. Because we did one and then he had a cousin that had a restaurant, so he, we did another for that, that restaurant and kept going on and on. And at one point we had this really fun job. They had a bar and they wanted to put a volcano behind the bar on the wall. And so we put a piece of red plexiglass in the wall and painted the volcano on top of it, but let these rivulets of red show through. And then we put a revolving light behind it a little speaker and a, a little thing that made smoke. So about every half an hour, the volcano would erupt and the bar owner loved it because people would stay for another drink till the next volcano eruption. <laughs> uh, from fourth to 12th grades, I t attended classes at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And this had really exposed me to uh, a wide range of art throughout the museum because on the way to class, I'd walk through the galleries and Sometimes after class, I was waiting for my mom to pick me up. We wander through the galleries and look at different pieces of artwork. And this is one that I remember captivated me really, really strongly when I was about that age. It's uh, Storm in the Mountains by Albert Bierstadt. And I remember standing in front of it, just trying to figure out how he did it, how he painted that thing. It was so amazing to me. And the beautiful big swirl of a composition was um, just really captivating. Uh, after high school, I enrolled in Massachusetts College of Art, and I, uh, I had a teacher, and we, every, day, uh, every week we had to bring in a painting that we did at home for a little project. And so I brought in a painting one time, and the teacher looked at it and said, well, you shouldn't paint from photographs. And I said, well, I didn't paint from a photograph, I made it up. And she said, well, you shouldn't make things up until you've been painting for at least like 10 years outside, and I thought, 10 years, I'll be so old by then. I'll... <laughs> it was kind of daunting, but I did go out and I bought a plein air painting easel, and right away I was hooked. I realized that I just love plein air painting. And it was um, that making that connection with nature that really um, had a profound influence on me. So 
Planar painting really is the basis of all of my art making. Um, I don't always paint, or usually don't paint my large studio paintings directly from the sketch I did in nature. But the planar painting lets me connect with nature and understand it and sort of dissect it visually and then reassemble it onto the uh, canvas. So I, every part of that painting I have to analyze. If I'm looking at a tree, I have to say, well, what color is that tree? How do the branches uh, branch off of the trunk? And what are the leaves? And what color are the leaves? And how are they grouped? All these different questions because I have to paint that. So it really creates this much deeper sense of concentration between me, the subject, and the uh, painting that I'm painting. Uh, it's uh, pretty challenging to be a plein air painter because you basically have to bring all of your studio supplies out into the field somehow. So you can't do that. So you have to narrow it down to just the essential supplies. And that still ends up to be a pretty big backpack. Um, my backpack probably weighs 30 or 40 pounds when it's all loaded up. And we have all kinds of challenges that we have to confront too. Um, unlike a still life or a portrait painter, we can't rearrange things to make a better composition. We have to wander around and find something that's already made and make that into the composition. We can't change the lighting. Um, we have changing light and shadows as the sun's moving overhead. This side of the building was sunny when I started, but now it's in shade. Uh, the wind comes along, you're painting this beautiful reflection in a little harbor and then it gets windy and reflection's gone. The tide goes out. Uh, years ago, I was shooting a video uh, for spleen, uh, Streamline art videos, and it took the videographer so long to set up all his equipment. By the time he got it set up, the tide had gone out. It was in Maine, so the tide goes out really far in Maine. So we had to pack up and move to a different location because that composition wasn't going to work with low tide. So we have to work quickly because all of these things are changing. One time I was teaching a workshop and we were down in Wild Harbor up in West Falmouth and there was this cute little hair shop 12 and about five or six of the students in the class were painting it. And then all of a sudden this guy comes out getting his rowboat, rows out to the boat and sails away. <laughs> and everyone's looking there with long faces. Now what do we do? And he said, well, that's plein air painting. Then there's all other things like heat, the environmental things, heat, cold, noise, bugs, talkative onlookers and such. So you have to deal with all those things when you're out uh, painting plein air. But in spite of that, it's the most dynamic field of uh, painting going on right now. All across the country, there are dozens and dozens of plein air events where they'll have a little a town, will have plein air artists come in, they'll paint for a week, they'll have a big party and a celebration and a sale at the end of the week. It's really gotten quite popular. Uh, there's a, a magazine editor, he says plein air painting is the new golf. <laughs> Many people consider John Constable the father of plein air painting. He was active in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century. He was uh, an Englishman. And this is most pic his most famous picture. It's called the Hay Wayne. And his method was to go out into the countryside and make these plein air sketches, studying the meteorology and the topography and the botany, just the whole uh, milieu of what he found in the English countryside. And on the left, you can see one of his plein air sketches that he made. And on the right is the Hay Wayne, the famous painting. But he couldn't have made that Hay Wayne with that much truth and honesty if he hadn't been doing those plein air sketches previously to painting this. So that gave him the knowledge to figure out how he can integrate all of those different features of the landscape into a finished studio painting. Previous to Constable, like a lot of the studio landscapes, they looked very mannered, they didn't look natural. They had artificial shapes and artificial colors and values and such. But Constable was really the first one, not maybe the very first, but people consider him the first major uh, artist to go out and paint from the landscape. Following Constable were the Barbizon painters. They painted in a village called Barbizon in France, and it was right next to the Fontainebleau forest. So they would often go into the forest and paint landscapes and into the surrounding countryside. Uh, this is uh, Francis, uh, Charles Francis Daubigny, and his painting is on the left, and on the right is Claude Monet's painting called Impressionism. And it's interesting to compare the two. Most of the Impressionists did at one time paint with the Barbizon painters. And you can see the brushwork similarity. The Barbizon painters were much more loose with their brushwork, and that's where the Impressionists got that um, 
that sort of got that idea from that they don't have to be as, everything doesn't have to be as rendered as tightly. And so they were, you know, compatriots and, and painters, but the Impressionists eventually realized that when they brought their paintings into their houses, they looked drab and they didn't have the spark and the, the vibrance that they had when they're out of doors. So the question was, how can they make that tree look nice and bright and sunny, like the, the sun was shining on the tree or the sun shining on the water or the different features of the landscape? Um, so the Impressionists realized that if they ramped up the color, they could get much more colorful paintings that would hold some of that uh, power that they found in the landscape. The problem is if you make the colors stronger, which means making them more towards the middle value, it also makes the value weaker. For instance, if you look at the color blue, if you make it lighter, it's gonna to turn to a baby blue, very pale, not very strong color. If you make it darker, it'll turn to a navy blue. It's a dark color, but it's very, not very strong color-wise. So the Impressionists tried to keep their colors basically in the middle range and not have a lot of large passages of darker light colors. So what Monet did with sunrise is he wanted to get that power of that sun, but if he lightened it up to make it light like a bright sun, it would lose the it would look sort of like a pale peachy color. It wouldn't have that same punch. Value-wise, it might be okay because it would be lighter than the surrounding clouds, but color-wise, it would lose its power. So he chose to to um, emphasize the color rather than the value. But you can see down here, I made a black and white uh, copy of the painting. You see how drab and uninteresting that sun looks and the whole composition is just sort of this gray smeary thing. Where with the Barbizon painters, it's still, the composition still holds up. You can still see what's happening. So that's the challenge of plein air painting, landscape painting, and one of the issues that the Barbizon and the Impressionists were dealing with was how to retain the value and the um, brightness that they saw out of doors. This is an experiment I did um, when I was out painting one day, I was uh, actually shooting a video and I was trying to show how we as artists have a really limited range of values. We can't get our colors as dark as you find in nature and we can't get them as bright as you find in nature. On the left and the top left, there's uh, three stripes I painted on my panel. And you can see the white stripe. I could pretty much match all of those light colors with the white light stripe and the gray stripe. But with the black stripe, that's pure black. And if you look at the shadows of those trees next to it, they're much darker than that black. So there's no way I will ever be able to paint those trees as dark as they are in real life. And then you could say, well, what if you move your panel into the shade? If I do that, I'll have a nice dark sh shadow, as you can see in the bottom slide. But now look at the white uh, stripe, the white panel there. See the grass next to it? That grass is already lighter than the panel. And when I put an ochre green color on that panel, it's going to be even darker. So that's what we're dealing with, with in landscape painting, is trying to get the sensation of a full range of values, but also a full range of color. And I think one of the things that really brought this home to the Impressionist paintings is you, in, you envisioned an impression, uh, Victorian house in that era. The windows were small. They were lit by you know, a gas lamp. So they would bring their paintings into a really dimly lit room and the color would completely fade away. That's why they were trying to bring back the color. Uh, this is an example of uh, another painting by Monet, and you can see here how we really ramped up the color. The colors are very vibrant, strong, and bright. There's not a lot of darkness in the values, though. If you look at that tree in the center, in real life, if you looked at that tree, it would probably be uh, fairly dark against that sky. But he said, I want color to predominate over value. So he um, kept the, most of the colors there in the middle range. Remember, like the blue, like a royal blue or a well, even red might be a better example. Red is a very strong color. When you put white in it, it turns into pink, which is kind of a weak color. If you put black into it, it turns to maroon, which is not a weak color color-wise. So what he did was he said, I'm going to keep all my colors in the mid-range and have the colors as strong as I can. One way to paint, overcome this dilemma is to paint on a cloudy day. 
And that sort of helps a little bit. Um, this is an exercise that I do, I call it the disappearing canvas. And what I, I'll talk about the site size method in, in a minute, but what I do is I try to paint the colors exactly as I see them and draw it as exactly as I can. And then I should be able to line up with a camera the scene that I painted and have the painting superimposed on it, and it should uh, somewhat disappear into the landscape. Um, it's a good exercise that I do with a lot of my workshop students too, because it teaches them to be really careful. And you think you have the colors exact, but when you line it up next to the, the actual color you see in nature, you can see your errors much more easily. Uh, to help with this issue, I made this thing up that I call a site size viewfinder. Susan asked me to explain what site size is. Site size was uh, actually developed for figure painting. And John Singh Asajan, for instance, used that method when he painted all of his figures. What you would do is you would have a figure, say, stand there, and your canvas would be right next to him. It wouldn't be back where you are. The canvas and the figure would be next to each other, and you'd stand back here, and you'd look out, and you'd make a mark on the canvas where the top of the head was, and you'd stand back at your looking spot, and you determine if that was right. And if that was right, you'd mark where the chin was and the shoulders and so on. Then you'd, you'd fill in everything as you go along. But the point is you draw from back, you look from back here and you draw up there. And when it's done, you look at the figure and the painting right next to each other. The painting of the figure is the same size as what you see. That's where they get sight size. So that was a method that I learned when I was studying figure drawing with Bob Cormier. And then I thought, how can I, adapt that to landscape painting. Well, you can't because you can't put your piano next to a mountain that's 10 miles away or a cloud that's three miles up in the sky. Or... So you have to figure out a way to sort of approximate that. So what I did is I made this grid and I attach it, as you, can, as you can see in the photo, I attach it to the side of my panel and everything I see in the grid, I just transfer horizontally or I can do it above too, vertically onto my panel. And so I call it site, site size landscape painting. And it works really well. It makes my drawing go much faster. And as I was saying, it's really hard to paint fast enough when you're out in the landscape because you have all these changes that you're dealing with. So this speeds up the process quite a bit. And I started um, using it. And I, when I do my workshops, I thought, well, I should tell the people about the grid that I've been using because it's not fair for me to keep it secret. So then they wanted one. And it's like we kind of made them out of cardboard, but it does, didn't work that well. But my son is an industrial designer, and the company he works for make, was making things out of metal. So I asked him, I designed one, said, could you make this? And he said, yeah. So they uh, produce them, and I now sell them on my website. And um, it's, uh, um, I think it's really helpful for landscape painters, but you can also use it in the studio, too. Uh, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the transcendentalists, luminists, and the physicists. Um, let me get my slide right here. Sorry. Uh, during my youth, I didn't know it at the time, but there were two things that were had somewhat of an influence on me and would coalesce later in my career. Uh, I grew up near Boston in Quincy, and I was sort of aware of Walden Pond. I went there and the Transcendentalists and Emerson and Thoreau and all that. And um, I heard the term Transcendentalist, but didn't know really much about it. I didn't, never really investigated that much. And while I was going to art classes at the Museum of Fine Arts, there were certain paintings that really captivated me. And this was one of them. It's uh, Martin Johnson Heed's Lake George. And at the time, the thing I was fascinated with was the rocks. Like, how would he paint those rocks so he feel like you could pick them up and throw them into the water? And the calmness and the peacefulness of it, and the little man pushing the boat off the shore. And, you know, I had rowboats, so I could sort of identify with that. And the rocks kind of look like, even though it's Lake George, the rocks you'd find in Quincy Bay, very rocky harbor. So I really, identif really identified with this picture. And there were several other paintings, too, that I was um, quite taken with. Um, but I didn't know at the time, but these paintings were referred to as luminous paintings. And they were connected to the transcendentalists. The transcendentalists were a philosophical and literary, lit excuse me, literary group. And they 
uh, believed that experience through the natural, through the experience of the natural world, you could reach the divine. And light was particularly symbolic of the divine. They also had a belief in self-reliance. They didn't think we needed institutions, um, that we could forge a direct pathway to the divine because there was an underlying unity to everything, including the individual. Uh, there was what they call the oversoul, and they, they believed that that connected all of humanity and the universe and, and nature. Uh, they also believed that intuition was as valid a source of knowledge as empirical or logic or reason. And one of their intuitions was that nature was a spirit con spiritual conduit for the divine. So it's interesting that about 100 years later, art historians were looking at some of the paintings that were painted in New England in the 1850s, around the time the transcendentalists were active, and they thought, you know, there's a real similarity between these paintings and transcendentalist philosophy. This idea of the sort of sublimity of nature and uh, the transcendental, this paint, I mean, the luminous painters give this sense of sort of meditating with nature. The surfaces were really smooth. You don't see any brush mark because it's, they, the individual is disappearing. So they thought that maybe these painters were also influenced by the transcendentalists. And when they determined that probably was the case because they were active at the same time, they lived in the same area, and there seems to be a correlation between what the transcendentalists were talking about and what the luminous painters were, speak, were painting, they said, yeah, there was a correlation. So they called these painters luminous painters. Here's three of the more prominent ones, Sanford Gifford, it's Henry Lane. Now, everyone says Fitzhugh Lane, but they just recently realized his middle name was actually Henry, which is kind of funny. It still seems odd calling him Fitz Henry Lane. And John F. Kensett. And if you look at these paintings, you can see that there is a similar concept of sort of quiet, meditative, peaceful scenes where the, as I say, the, the hand of the artist disappears. For instance, if you look at a Van Gogh painting, right away you say, see Van Gogh, and Van Gogh's personality is all over that painting. With these paintings, the artist disappears. There's no real presence of the artist. You just sort of blend right into the landscape that the artist has created. Um, excuse me. I'm trying to keep track of where I am with the little slide presentation too. Uh, another thing that um, interests me as a landscape painter is that everything I paint has something to do with physics because I'm painting the world. And so I, every now and then I get these, you know, these little insights and I read a little bit of physics. I'm certainly not a physicist, but it's kind of interesting me, to me. I have an amateur's interest in physics because my subject matter is dependent on the physics and the micro and the macro level. Uh, for instance, when I'm painting the sky, I'm analyzing the color, and then I'm thinking, well, why is the sky blue, and why is it bluer there than down at the horizon, and why is it orange over the sun? And then I find out there's a thing called Rayleigh scatter, where the light rays, as they come from the, sky, the sun, the uh, shorter rays, which are blue, get scattered, and the uh, longer rays, which are the red and the yellow, come straight at you. So when you look at the sun, the sun looks bright and it's white, but all around it, you have those blue rays that are scattering out through, through the sky, which gives the sky the blue color. It's actually, there's some uh, purple in there too, because there's ultraviolet purple, but we can't detect it with our eyes. So we only see the blue. So um, things like that sort of fascinate me. And another aspect of physics that is interesting is that the, um, the particle that gives us light, which is the photon, is one of the most important particles that scientists use to study the workings of the universe. So we have the photon that the scientists use to study the workings of the universe. We have light that the transcendentalists thought was sort of all uh, really important as far as conveying the sense of divinity in the world. And we have the luminous painters who were focusing on painting light. So I thought it was interesting how those three aspects of light sort of all are very important to three, um, three of the subjects that I'm interested in and three of the things that sort of permeate my paintings. Um, if I'm painting a rock, for instance, one or the other, when I'm out painting by myself, I have all these thoughts that come into my mind. 
And if I'm painting a rock, I think that if I knew everything about that rock, I would know everything about the universe. I would know where we came from, because according to physicists, matter can't be destroyed or created. So that rock has existed forever. I would know how time began. I would know if there's a God, how were things created? I have the answer to all those things. So that's another little fascinating tidbit about painting the landscape that um, keeps me intrigued. And uh, when I'm out there painting in the field, those are some of the things that I sort of meditate on. Um, so those influences sort of formed my cultural identity. I'm from Boston. I went to Massachusetts College of Art. I went to the Museum of Fine Arts and such. I was aware of the transcendentalists and the luminous painters. So that's my cultural identity that I'm really proud of. And if I had been born in another place, I'd be painting different, a different type of painting. If I had been born in California or Europe or the Orient or whatever. So that's sort of my cult, my heritage that I'm trying to sort of carry on the tradition of representational painting in New England and having it sort of somewhat based on my forebears and painters who came before me. Um, for the next few paintings, a uh, few slides, I'll just uh, scroll through some of the paintings I've been working on over the years and talk about them a little bit. This one I called Transfiguration. And it's, a, it's been an obsession of mine to paint light reflecting on water. And the interesting, interest, interesting thing is I have to, in order to make that light glow, I have to subdue all the other colors. So it's a sort of back and forth. If I subdue the colors too much, it looks like it's the moon and it's a night scene. If I don't subdue them enough, the water doesn't glow and get that nice bright look, uh, bright sparkle to it that I'm trying to recreate. And I did a sort of a series of paintings based on that little uh, spot of sunlight down in the bottom. One time I was painting in Boston Harbor and I saw that and I really studied it and tried to paint it as accurately as I could and understand how I could make it look like it's glow glowing. So I've done that in a couple of paintings and I brought one here that I'll show you where I've been working on that idea of the little spot of sunlight and then in the distance in the background sort of the scattering light across the ripples of the water. Um, for this painting, I had this is imaginary, um, as most of my larger landscapes are. And I needed a vertical accent in there because it was too, there were too many horizontals. So that's why I added the osprey stand. Uh, this was painted, I was, years ago, there was a man and he was living on his boat in Squatigue Harbor, where we live. And the ice had frozen in over the winter. And he had a dilemma because at this stage, the ice was too soft for him to walk on, but too hard for him to row his boat through. So he was stranded on his boat in the middle of Squeaky Harbor for a couple of weeks. And I was driving by one time, it was sunset, and I saw him. I said, oh, that'd be a cool painting to make. So a few days later, I started this painting. It wasn't based on sketches, just sort of my memory and imagination of what I saw. But one of the values of plein air painting is I paint the landscape so much that I can make up things completely made up out of things that I saw. I don't have to, I don't have to see the exact thing that I'm painting. And it gives me a lot of freedom to invent things. Here's some plein air paintings I've done. Uh, on the top is a collier that was painted up in Duluth during a painting trip. And on the left side is the painting. On the right side, I took a photograph of the collier to see how close I came to it. I did make some changes compositionally in the, the painting you'd see in the lower right. There were some bushes out of my view, but they were there, and some driftwood at my feet. And so I thought if I brought them into the scene, it would make a little bit more interesting painting. And it would also give more truth to the scene because they were really there. So when you bring elements that aren't actually in your viewpoint into the scene, sometimes it creates a a more complete story of what you're painting and what you were looking at. Uh, the sunset is another uh, challenging thing to paint because it happens so quickly. So with sunsets, you're really painting the future, the present, and the past. And what I did was, this was out in Colorado, and every day when I'd come back from painting, I saw this little valley with the village down uh, in the, between the mountains. Now, that'd be a great painting, but I was always too late to, to do it because this was the light that I saw. So then one day I came, uh, packed up a little bit early, came to this site, and I set up maybe a half hour before sunset, and I started blocking things in, kind of painting what I think was going to happen. And then as the sunset just beyond the distant mountains, I had about 10 minutes to paint what I actually saw, what was actually happening. 
And then for about 10 minutes after that, I painted what I remembered. So it's like you're painting the, the future, the present and the past with um, plein air landscape painting. And the painting in the lower right isn't what you would call a luminous painting, but every, like the original luminous, every painting they did, what didn't fit sort of the definition of luminism. And this was a scene painted out in Colorado, uh, California. And I was, once again, I was captivated by the light, but this isn't a place that we, you, where you would go for quiet meditation. It was windy, the waves were crashing on the shore, and it just had a lot of energy to it, as opposed to luminous paintings that usually don't have a lot of that type of energy. Uh, as I was saying, if I knew everything about a rock, I'd have all these answers to uh, what the meaning of life is and where we came from, where we're going and such. So I called this uh, painting Singularity. And I was really, I just wanted to do a portrait of a rock. I, as I said, I grew up in Quincy and the beaches are all rocky there. And when we were kids, we'd run over the rocks and we'd hit them with our boats and all that. So rocks were important in my life. And I wanted to paint a, uh, just, a, just a rock. And it almost fills the whole panel. And there's a lot of texture created in the middle of the rock with that. You can see the um, barnacles and such. That was all created with texture. And I'll show you how we did that when we do the demo part. But um, so that's all it was, was just sort of a study of a rock with a lot of texture. Uh, this is another imaginary painting. One day I said, I think I'm gonna paint a night painting. So I did the painting and then I realized it looked a little bit too sweet. So I put in the chain link fence and the chain link fence also act as, acted as a way to get some light to the other side of the panel. Otherwise your eye would have been stuck on the moon too much and you couldn't get away with it. So a lot of times you have to have things in other parts of the paintings to move your eye around the, uh, the painting surface. Uh, this was one painted out in Colorado and uh, this was a studio painting, but the sketch had no water in it. It was a dry canyon. When I was working on this painting, I thought, you know, it'd be more interesting. And I think I could, you know, really more thoroughly describe the phenomena of sunlight if I had a reflection of the light that the rocks were casting onto the water. So I added the water in the, in the, in the painting. And I was really trying to keep the values strong in this painting. And I think my paintings are kind of a combination between the Barbizon and the Impressionists. I don't have a lot of um, really dark, dark values in a lot of my paintings, like big sections like the Barbizon painters would have, but I don't have as bright a coloring as the Impressionists. But I have more, more coloring than the Barbizon and uh, less value than the Barbizon. This was a painting that I spend a lot of time in the summer, you know, we live in Cape Cod and I'd be walking in ankle deep water and looking down at all the reflections on the, on the sea floor and wondering how to paint them because I thought it was so fascinating They have this flickering quality. So they, they, you know, they move really fast. It's hard to sort of discern them. But one day I said, it's almost, I realized it's almost like a chain link fence where the two reflections cross. It's like a double bright spot there. So then I said, oh, that's what I can do. So I made these sort of longish oval shapes and wherever one oval crossed another, I put a little dot of lighter color, brighter color. And that gave the impression of that um, ripply reflection that you get on the seafloor. And then in the background, you can see that there's a lot of texture in the water. And I did that with dragging my paintbrush, the back of my paintbrush through the wet paint, sort of scraping into the wet paint and creating these horizontal lines that gave the impression of it being ripples. This is a painting I called the red boat. I did the marsh and it was too green. It needed something to break it up. And obviously the opposite color of green is red. So I thought, ah, I'll put a red boat in there. And if the problem is when you put a red boat, it makes a big, uh, strong statement. So if you look at the bow of the boat, it would go off the paper or off the panel, except that I put a stake that the boat is tied to. So that stops your eye from just going right out of the, of the painting. And then the stern leads your eye into the, the creek, off into the distance, into the background. And then I put a cinder block in the foreground just for fun, because I thought it was kind of cool to do that. This was a fun painting. I was, years ago, I was flying out to uh, Minneapolis for a, or Indianapolis for a painting event. And there was this enormous thunderstorm out the window. And we had a little TV screen in the seat back in front of me. And I thought, 
I wonder if the thunderstorm's on the, the news. So I turned on the weather channel. Sure enough, at that time, they're talking about this massive thunderstorm over the Midwest. So I thought, this is amazing. I'm flying across the country, looking out my window at a thunderstorm, and I'm watching the TV as they talk about that very thunderstorm. So I had a little piece of, uh, some pieces of paper and a pencil. I thought, I'm gonna do some sketches of the thunderstorm. So I did a bunch of little sketches of the, uh, pencil sketches of the thunderstorm. And then when I got home, I made this painting called Thunderstorm over the Midwest from a plane window. Um, but it was a really fun little experiment to do and seeing if I could paint the thunderstorm from memory and from my little sketches. Um, for the next segment of the presentation, I'm going to take you on a little journey that begins just after the plein air sketch. And it's OK, I have these plein air sketches. What do I do with them? And I'll show you how I uh, complete them in the studio. Uh, the studio paintings are based on empirical observations, things that I've seen in the field. Um, and I've dissected them, as I said, and put them back on my panel, my imagination and logic. So like, I can imagine something, but it has to work logically. So it, for instance, to simplify it, if the sun's here and the tree's here, the cast shadow is going to be down here, things like that. So it's those three things, empirical observations, imagination and logic that I use to make the studio paintings from. As I said, I usually don't make a plain air painting and make a just an enlarged version of that. But sometimes I do, if I really like the plain air painting. I think it'll work better. So uh, let's see if we can do this without spilling paint. This is the viewfinder. I was talking about it's just a very lightweight I just clamp it onto my easel and it has a grid it's like you know you're in high school and you grid off a magazine picture and you draw it it's the same idea basically as that when I st start a painting the first thing I do is an underpainting so I can get the composition and I just use black and white because black and white uh, value determines your composition not color so I can set my composition, and if I need to make any changes, it's really easy to change because I just have to mix black and white. I'm not worried about matching color. And I'll make you know, significant changes to the composition as I'm laying it out. And then once I get it so I'm pretty happy with it, I'll start applying color and texture. Uh, this was a painting I did out in Utah uh, near um, Glen Canyon. I was on a painting trip there last year. And remember the rock painting that we saw, uh, that I showed you, the singularity? I want to create some of that same texture in this foreground. Because the foreground, the, the, the ground out there is very textural. It has all the um, rocks. It's very rocky and rugged. And it has the, um, the foliage is sort of gnarly. And so what I'm going to do is mix in some acrylic mediums. This is coarse bead gel this has tiny little beads in it and what happens is i'll paint on a layer of the beads i'll have to let it dry you won't see that aspect and then i'll paint when it dries i'll paint another uh, layer of bead gel on it and the gel gets stuck on the little bumps of beads it makes a little lump like you saw in the singularity painting so i'll have this all over lumpy texture in this foreground now the thing about texture is i like to have texture replicate what we actually see and experience in nature. So this foreground is going to be very textural. But as things move off in the distance, you're not that aware of the texture. You're aware of more of the shapes and such. And then when you get to the sky, there's no texture in the sky. So I'm going to have sort of an aggressive texture in the foreground, little or no texture in the middle ground, because that's pretty far away, and a really smooth sky. So I like to have this tactile connection between the painting and reality. And this is coarse pumice gel. This will make some texture too, not as aggressive as the beads will. Now I'm going to also obscure somewhat my underpainting, but there'll be enough of it there that I can repaint it. For me, painting is a 
it's a fairly long process because I use a lot of different layers and a lot of different techniques. Some artists, they can get a painting done in a day or two, but with me, it's usually months. I also like to let them sit at different stages and look at them. And oftentimes I'll make significant changes from what I originally was painting um, to what it turns into because the more you look at it, the more you see things that just don't work very well. One time I was painting these trees and I thought they looked fine. And then I walked down to in the studio one day and said, there's a big peace sign in the middle of that tree, just the shape of the light and the shadow. And every time I looked at it, I couldn't get away from the peace sign. So I had to change the shape of the tree. But I hadn't noticed that for you know, quite a while as, as I was working on the painting. It's good to, in the morning, they. I'll get down and I'll look at my paintings and see what I did the previous day. And they call that the fresh eye. So when you look at a painting with like a fresh eye, it, um, you see things that you didn't notice when you were staring at it for hours and hours during the day before. The other thing I do often is I'll turn my painting upside down because that allows you just to see the, the design or the composition rather than objects. Because if you, if you're looking at it upside right, you keep seeing objects. You turn it upside down, there's no objects, it's just all these shapes. And you can tell if a shape isn't working or not by turning it upside down. And by isn't working, I mean, sometimes a shape might be sending you off the canvas, or there might be two shapes, too similar and too close together. You want to have variety in your painting. So um, turning it upside down works. Also a mirror, I look at it, at it in a mirror a lot of times too. So I'll let this dry, and when it dries, I'm going to put another coat on just to make it a little bit more aggressive. And then after that, I'll put on some of this coarse gel that I just opened up. And then I'll sand it to get rid of some of the bumps, maybe too big and too aggressive, and they'll jump out too much. So I'll give it a little sanding to keep it somewhat uniform. I'm also going to make some lines right now that sort of follow the topography of this hillside. There's a hillside coming here, and then this hillside's falling into that little gully there. This sort of directional lines, and that will help when I do the rendering of the, the land, the rocks and the sand and the dirt. Now I'd put this aside and as I said, I'd wait. I, I could probably give another coat in a couple hours if I wanted to. Now another approach is not using any um, texture and just going right in for, for the color from my underpainting. This is an imaginary scene, but you know, I was in Quisset this past summer and I was standing at the end of the harbor where they have a stone pier and I was looking at the reflections and the shadows and such that the stone pier was making on the water and I thought that would be really interesting to try to recreate and paint. Should I wait just a sec, Mike? Yeah. Okay. What's that? Yeah, I'm done with that. This will is actually okay. It'll give me a minute to put away my acrylic mediums. <laughs> so these are acrylic mediums, by the way. The underpainting is acrylic, and the overpainting will be oil. You can paint um, oil on top of acrylic, but you can't paint acrylic on top of oil. It's like if you're painting a house, you can put oil base on top of latex, but not latex and oil, or else it'll scratch right off.
Okay, we're back. We're back. Great. So um, for this step here, I'm going to put just paint very basic. I don't like to get too well defined in the beginning of my paintings because I may change things. And if I spend a lot of time fussing around getting all these little things finished, and then I realize I should change something, it's going to, I'm going to be resistant because I put so much effort into that. So I start kind of broad and sloppy. And then I eventually get neater and neater and more accurate. I want to paint this area here right now to show you how I would approach this. This is the shadow area of that stone wall. I want a dark color for the stone part. You'd be a little darker than that. I want it really to set back in shadow. Down by the water, there's going to be a little bit of a little waterline stain here. That'll be a little darker. It might be too dark, but I want to make this a little dark. So let me move some of that up. This step gets me like 80% accuracy in the color. There again, I don't want to spend too much time on it because once I get this whole thing filled, I may realize that one color passage is, not, is too light, too dark, too warm, too cool, whatever. So I can easily change it rather than spending forever trying to get the colors exact. Also, I don't know what the colors are going to look like till they're next to other colors and they react with the other colors that they're adjacent to. So it's, it would be silly for me to spend a lot of time getting that color right. And then when I get it finished, I realize, oh, that, uh, the value is much too light or too dark. So the interesting thing here is, this is what interested me about this painting, is we have the stone pier, we have the cast shadow in the water, we have the cast shadow in the water with the reflection also. And here we have just the reflection with no cast shadow. And here we have the water with no cast shadow or reflection. So there's this real intricate scenario going on in this, in this little section of the painting. This cast shadow and the reflection where they overlap is going to be dark. Because the reflection is dark and the shadow is dark, so they're like double dark. Now, the, this section of the reflection doesn't have the cast shadow on it, so it's going to be lighter and warmer. So I'm going to lighten this up a little bit and warm it up. That's too light. just a little lighter than that. If I were at home, I would be spending a little more time mixing these colors, but we have a time constraint too, so. But I just wanted to get you, give you an idea of the process that I go through. Other artists, you know, have a completely different method. Some artists may have a method somewhat similar to mine. And this cast shadow here is going to be pretty blue because there's no reflection there. So the only reflection would be like from the sky. It might be a little bit greenish too because you can, there's a little bit, trans, bit of transparency to this water. Then the water around it is going to be lighter than that. And near the shore, it's going to be a little bit green because you can see a little bit through the water. 
but as the water moves away from your eye, the angle changes that you're looking at it. And now you see more reflection. When you're standing at the shore, you can look down and you see your feet. When you look at the horizon, you see the reflection of the sky. So there's a transition that happens between seeing through the water and then seeing the reflection. And it depends on the angle that you're looking at it at. This gives me a whole new respect for Bob Ross. <laughs> and the water's getting bluer off in the distance. And that's how I would sort of block in that area fairly quickly. But you can see what sort of the scenario is going to be. And when I complete everything, get everything finished with the first coat of paint, then I would go back and refine these colors a little bit more. I may say, well, this is too dark. That's maybe too, definitely too prominent there. I'd soften that. And maybe a little bit cooler color on the shadow side of that stone. But I don't know that till I fill everything. Because colors are always in relate, seen in relation to what all the adjacent colors. So until I get everything sort of colored in about, you know, 80% accurate, I can go back and refine it further. So that pa painting would progress to this step, would be the next step. In this one, you can see this texture. I don't know if you can see it at that, can you see it in the screen? A little bit, but anyway, there's a lot of texture in this grass in the foreground. There's a lot of texture in these rocks. And then the sky is very smooth, and there's a little bit of horizontal striated texture in the water. All of those textures are sort of replicating, replicating what we find in nature. So the next thing I would do with this would be to give a glaze to this water, and um, that would help to bring out the texture. A glaze is a thin sort of syrupy consistency paint, and when you paint it on, it just changes the tone of the surface that you're painting it on. And if you paint it on and wipe it off, It'll, you'll wipe it off the high spots, but it'll be deposited in the crevices and the cracks, so it enhances the texture a lot to the um, surface that you're painting. How's our time? Out there. Yeah. Um, so that would be that step. And then this is sort of the completed step. And this is a painting where I was talking about the reflection in the water down there where I was really interested in trying to create that little blob of sunlight. And I think I put a little scratch and bringing it over here, I can repair that easy enough, but I want to make this a little bit lighter. So what I would do is when I get home in the studio, make this surrounding water just a little bit lighter with a glaze too. There again, it's a semi-transparent layer that you put on where you can just modify the color a little bit. And um, I think that's our time. But uh, do you have any questions? Have we got some time for questions, I think? Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, any questions in the audience or online? Well, uh, it, is it on? Okay. Uh, you said it takes you months sometimes to paint the paintings. So how many paintings can you get done in a year if it takes you months <laughs> to paint a painting? Good question. I always work on several at, at a time. So I may have anywhere from four to eight paintings going at once. And sometimes they go along really quickly. Everything seems to work right. And other times 
I get halfway through and I realize there's a major compositional problem or some type of flaw in the drawing or something. So I'll have to repaint it, sort of retrace my steps a little bit and then move forward again. Um, but the fastest I could do like a painting like this would be, the very fastest would be a month. Typically I'd want like a couple of months to work on it. It's also a lot of time I like to spend looking at it and sort of contemplating because suddenly though, as I said, like the peace sign pops out and you didn't see it before and you've been working on it forever and say, like, wow. And then you can't unsee it. Like every time you look at it, you see it. So how do you know when it's ready then? Uh, when I don't see any more flaws and it looks fine and I've looked at it for a few days. But it's amazing when I, most times when I think the painting's done, I'll let it sit in the studio for maybe a couple of weeks and I make a lot of changes. And I think, whew, good thing I didn't send it out then. It would have been terrible. Uh, we have one online, I think. Do you always use uh, acrylic paint for your underpaintings or do you use oil sometimes as well? I almost always use acrylic um, because it's easy to change. I can change it on the spot. I don't have to wait for it to dry. And if I were using oil, you're either wiping it off and then repainting it or waiting for it to dry. With the acrylic, this is acrylic gesso. It's not uh, acrylic paint. So the acrylic gesso is a stable uh, ground to paint on with oil paints. And um, I like to have as few layers of oil paint as I can, even though I end up having several layers. But if I were painting and underpainting with oil paint, that would be one more layer of a potentially un unstable surface. So if the fewer layers of oil paint I have, the better, I think. And it's easy to change, you know, it, it, it dries in a 15 minutes, it's dry and I can change something if I have to. One of our family's um, most popular children's books written and illustrated by Barbara Cooney is um, Miss Rumphius. Do you know the book? Is it, what is it? Miss Rumphius. No. Okay, so as a little girl, she's brought up by her grandparents and she helps her grandfather paint. Uh, he does landscape paintings and she's allowed to paint the clouds. And he says when she grows up, she has to do three things. She has to um, travel the world, but then come home to live by the sea and then to do something to make the world more beautiful. So my question for you is, when did you know that you were gonna do something to make the world more beautiful? <laughs> well, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, I, I don't know, it just sort of evolved slowly. You know, when I got out of college, um, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I became a yacht captain for a few years because I thought I could paint and sail at the same time. Then I realized I really can't. I did, I did do a lot of painting when I was sailing, but not enough. And I realized that if I want to be an artist, I really have to rededicate myself to learning how to draw and paint. That's when I went to Bob Cormier in Boston, and we drew the figure for two years with just charcoal, with just charcoal, and it improved my drawing so much. And it also taught me to slow down and really look at my work. At Mass Art, they were more, they were kind of into the abstract and more gestural things, and Bob Cormier and the um, site size drawing method is the exact opposite. It's like you very slowly, very carefully, you looked exactly at what you're uh, seeing and draw it exactly the way you see it. And the idea is by the time you can draw something exactly as you see it, you can draw anything. And then you can loosen up or you can tighten up at will. You have complete control over your, 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 your art making. So it was, it was sort of evolved, but as I said, when I was five years old, I remember I was in kindergarten, the teacher asked what it, everyone wanted to be, and I said an artist, so. I think we have time for one more question, if we have any in the audience, so that we are at time though, so. Uh, yes. Mike. I just want you to talk a little bit about making it up, painting, um, that you're not looking at that scene. Is this a painting that you've made up? Yes, um, but it's a scene I made up because I've seen things similar to it. So uh, when I'm out landscape painting, I do, I don't know, a hundred landscape sketches a year. I never really count them, but a lot, stacks of them. And that all sort of is somewhere contained in my memory, what I've painted. So a lot of times I'll just say, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a river. This was for a Western art show. 
So I said, I'm going to do a river with a fly fisherman. And then, okay, so I need some mountains. So then I just sort of make up the mountains. And maybe I need something in the foreground. So I put this rock in. So it just sort of evolves that way. It begins with a concept. And then I sort of take bits and pieces of my memory and imagination and put them together to make a painting. So, um, but as I said, I couldn't do it if I hadn't been plein air painting for so long and be able to like, how do I paint a rock so it looks like a rock? And that was the, you know, the fascinating thing with Worthington Richards painting at the Museum of Fine Arts. I was saying, how, how do you make those rocks look so real? So that's a, basically how I approach it. Joe, I think you're, you're certainly not the only person in this village, this town, or possibly this room who feels that just by understanding that rock, you can understand the universe. Uh, <laughs> and you've given us a little bit of insight into the beauty in the universe tonight just by explaining how you go about this, this beautiful process. So thank you so much. Thank you all.